Greetings, everybody. Thanks for joining me for this episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. I'm Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. You know the drill. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so. Click the notification bell. If you like the video, give us a thumbs up and share it on social media, as well as don't forget to check out all the goodies we've got down in the video description below. Today's question, dear pastor, in what state do we receive Christ's body and blood in Holy Communion? Are we eating and drinking his body and blood that was on the cross, his resurrected body and blood at some other point? Or is this question not dealt with in scripture and thus digging too deep into a topic that God has not revealed to us? I was also wondering how this plays into the fact that the apostles partook of the sacrament at the Last Supper, despite Christ having not yet been crucified and risen from the dead. Of course, what really matters is Christ himself, truly bodily present in the sacrament, but I was wondering if the church has reasoned with herself to find an acceptable answer. Did the Lutheran reformers have anything to say about this topic? All right, so this is an interesting question. Uh, Christ has only one body, of course, and that's the body that was conceived by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, suffered, died, was buried. Uh, it was the same body then which was resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, uh, and the same body then which will return on the last day. Uh, that, that much is clear from the evangelists. So after his resurrection, Jesus appears to the apostles and says in Luke 24, 39, Behold my hands and my feet that it is myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as uh, you see I have. The angels uh, also tell them in Acts 1.11, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven uh, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So he ascended with the same body with which he will return. And then St. John even writes in Revelation 1 verse 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even they who pierced him. So there isn't a difference between uh, Jesus' body before and after his resurrection. What is different is uh, that before the resurrection, Jesus is in what we call the state of humiliation. On the third day, then, he enters into his state of exaltation. John writes in John 7:39 that the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus also says in Luke 24, 40, uh, 24, 26, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? Now, his being glorified or his entering into glory aren't changes in him or the addition of a glory that wasn't previously there. That's because from the moment of his conception in the womb of the Virgin Mary, from the moment of the incarnation, God the Son was united with human flesh. And from that moment on, he is fully God and fully man, then with the human body and human soul. Uh, from that moment, St. Paul says in Colossians 2, 9, that in him uh, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You know, Leo the Great uh, wrote in the 4th century, that God the Son received the form of a slave without loss to his own majesty. The phrase, form of a slave, then, you know, comes from St. Paul's words in Philippians 2, 5-11. through St. Paul writes, Let this mind be among you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The form of a servant and the form of a slave, uh, those aren't, that's not human flesh. That's human weakness, frailty, infirmity. If the form of the slave were the human nature, then Jesus would have to shed the human nature at his exaltation. Again, Leo the Great explains this uh, in his Epistle 124. He writes, Of course, in the form of God, the Son was equal to the Father. 
And between the Father and the Only Begotten, there is no distinction in point of essence, no diversity in point of majesty. Nor, through the mystery of the Incarnation, has the Word been deprived of anything which should be restored him by the Father's gift. But the form of a slave, or bondservant, by which the impassable Godhead fulfilled a pledge of mighty loving kindness, is human weakness, which was lifted up into the glory of the divine power. And the Godhead and the manhood, being right from the virgin's conception, so completely united, that without the manhood, the divine acts, and without the Godhead, the human acts, were not performed. What this means is that in the Incarnation, the eternal Son of God assumed human flesh in its totality except, with, except uh, he was without sin. The Godhead and the human nature are so completely united that all Jesus works, that he works, are worked with both natures. Uh, he heals, which is an act of the divine nature, but he uses human words, human touch, human spit in a couple of cases. You know, he says in John 6, 51, the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So his human flesh gives life, uh, an act of the divine nature, but it is a life-giving flesh because it is the flesh of the eternal Son of God. Now, during the days of his humiliation, he uses his divine power and he manifests his glory only through his miracles. Uh, John 2.11 says that after the wedding of Cana, he, he manifested his glory. Uh, during his humiliation, he, he walks on water. After his exaltation, he walks through the locked door of the room where the disciples were hiding on the evening of the resurrection. So Christ could use his divine power uh, more often. He could have during his ministry. Uh, you know, he could have used his divine power to prevent his human sufferings. Cyril of Alexandria commented on uh, Jesus' words in John 19:28, I thirst. And he said, it would not have been difficult for the word who is almighty God to keep this away from his flesh. But just as he willingly allowed himself to endure the other sufferings, he endured this one too by his own free choice. So Christ defers the use of and the display of his divine power and majesty and glory, and he does so during the days of his humiliation for a very specific aspect of our redemption. Martin Chemnitz explains this really well. He writes, By such a humiliation and exanimation, or uh, it's another word for humiliation, the sin of disobedience and pride, which had been committed by our first parents, had to be expiated. This is what Paul is saying in Philippians 2, 6. When the Son was sent by the Father into the flesh in order that in this flesh he might show both subjection and obedience for us, he was unwilling beyond his call and before his time uh, to seize the use and manifestation of his divine power and activity in and through the assumed human nature. But rather he humbled himself and he made himself obedient to the Father even unto death and for this reason, God has given him a name which is above every name. Christ's humiliation, his self-emptying, his taking on the form of a slave or the form of a servant, uh, so that his power and his majesty, so that these things are hidden and concealed under our human weakness and infirmity, that is the undoing of the, of the pride of our first parents of Adam and Eve's uh, sinful pride. It's expiating, it's paying for their pride, that is, his humility and not using his divine nature fully, but concealing it. You know, Adam and Eve fell into the devil's temptation to be like God in Genesis 3, 5. Christ Jesus, though, who is in the form of God, who's equal to God, the Father in essence, power, glory, freedom, and the like, he humbles himself so that he can pay for the sin of human pride, and also then set an example for those who believe in him, an example of humble submission to God and of humble mutual submission to one another. Now, what does all of this mean then for the state of Christ's body that we receive in the Lord's Supper? Well, since there's only one body of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is the body that was given, that was conceived, born, suffered, died, buried, resurrected, ascended, and will return, which he gives us to eat and drink in his sacrament. There's no difference in his body and blood before or after the resurrection. What is different is how he uses or chooses not to use his divine power and majesty before and after the resurrection. 
This means the apostles receive the very same body and blood of Christ on Monday, Thursday that we receive in the divine service, the life-giving flesh and blood of the eternal Son of God. Thanks for the interesting question. We'll see you next time on ATP. Ask the pastor.